Well, good morning to the dear saints in the Waterford Church. Happy Sabbath. I want to thank you for joining me for worship this morning. My sanctuary is right here at the church, and of course yours is wherever you happen to be watching this from. But as usual, by faith, we're all going to take a journey to the throne of grace together this morning. As we get started, I want to remind you what our offering is going to be used for this week. This week, of course, is the 13th Sabbath, end of the quarter, and we're going to be focusing on the world budget, particularly the West Central Africa Division. And you can look on the back of your Sabbath School quarterly and get all the information about that division. It's a large division, has almost a a million members, over 5,000 or 4,000 churches, 5,000 companies, and they're doing a lot of great work there. So anything that you do not designate today for local church budget or for tithe and offering or for some other purpose is going to go towards supporting our global work. And I'm so thankful that we're part of a global work. Our ministry here doesn't just end at Yosemite Boulevard or in the boundaries of Waterford. But as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, we are part of a worldwide mission that's reaching the world with the three angels' messages, preparing people for the second coming of the Lord. And so I want to thank you for thinking of the global work today as we begin. I want to get right into the study of God's Word, so what I'm going to do this morning is have a little prayer, and then we're going to open the Bible, and we're going to study together. So if you don't have your Bible, I want to encourage you to go get it, and we'll open it in just a moment. But first, let's pray and ask for God's blessing as we study. Lord, I'm so grateful today for the opportunity to support your work, both locally and globally. And as we open your Word this morning, I pray for your Holy Spirit, that it might impress upon our hearts your will, your Word, Give us the confidence to understand that we have an anointing from the Holy One, that we might today know all things that are necessary for us to succeed and to overcome. Bless us now, I pray, so that we can be part of your church triumphant in these last days of earth's history. Our eyes are upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you brought your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 101, verse 2. 101, 2. Psalm 101.2. Psalm 101.2. I'm going to go ahead and read this verse for you. If you have Psalm 101, verse 2, in front of you, and this morning you are ready to hear the word of the Lord speak to your heart, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to, by faith, trust that you said it. Let's read together Psalm 101, verse 2. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I want to key in on that last part of the verse. I will walk within my house Within a, with a perfect heart. You know, since COVID started in March of this year, the lockdown started at the end of March, a lot of people have been confined to their homes or, or caused to adopt worked-at-home at policies if they've been fortunate enough to keep their job at all. A lot of people have been at home over these past few months quite a bit. And even with all the smoke we've had, with all these, this, this massively intense wildfire season, the smoke filling the air, a lot of people been, have been staying at home more because it's unhealthy to go out. But what we've seen is that whenever these lockdowns have been enforced in communities, rigid lockdowns where people can't go out, we've seen definitely an increase in mental health issues. People become more depressed uh, people become more stressed in their relationships. Uh, at, the, you know, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, as it looked like it was going to keep extending more than just two weeks, uh, some suggested we're either going to see a rise in pregnancies or a rise in divorce rates. And it'll remain to be seen you know, what is actually taking place as a result of these rigid lockdowns. But being in the home can be a challenge for some people. Uh, For relationships that are already not on solid ground, that are already on weak ground, there's not good communication, there's not tenderness and love in the relationship, you lock that couple together, and that experience is going to compound that issue, make it worse, not better. 
for parents that don't have good connections with their children, you lock them down in an environment where they're forced to be together for a protracted period of time, and most likely that those bad relationships are going to be compounded. Because the reality is, who we are as a human being in our home life really determines who we are every other place. Uh, we can, as a Christian, it sometimes is easy for some people to be a Christian for one hour in church or to put on their best face, their best foot forward for a short period of time in public. But when they're home, that's when they reveal who they truly are. Our true character emerges in the home. And I'll tell you, friends, if you can't be a Christian or if you're not a Christian in the home, first, you're really not a Christian anywhere. If you fail to be a Christian in the home, you fail everywhere. If you succeed in the home, you succeed everywhere. Because Christianity begins in the home. How we treat and interact with those whom we are supposed to love the most really reveals the type of experience we have. And, and it's not always easy. I remember when I was first married 20 years ago, before we had children, Joy and I had challenges in our marriage early on because we didn't date traditionally the way un, uh, non-Christian couples date. So we, we, didn't, we didn't live together, you know, and most of our relationship was long distance. So we spent very little time actually in each other's company for a whole year while we courted, uh, very little time in each other's company until we got married. And then all of a sudden, here we are living together, and we really didn't know each other that well. And of course, there was friction and there was tension uh, early on in our marriage. I remember as a, a young pastor... Here I am driving to church with my wife, and we would be arguing on our way to church until we pulled right into the parking lot. I don't remember what we're arguing about. Something probably pretty trifling or, you know, not that important. When looking back on it now, it probably wouldn't be that important. But we would be arguing about something, and we pull into the parking lot, and I have to get out of the the door after I just got done arguing the whole way to church with my wife, and then put on my good Christian faith good Christian face and be a good Christian pastor and say, hello, happy Sabbath. Oh, how wonderful it is to be here after I'd just been fighting with my wife the whole way to church. Now, that's not good. You know, you, that, and unfortunately, that's what happens in a lot of homes that uh, people don't have an authentic Christian experience in the home. And this unfortunately not only affects our witness in public, but if we have children, it really affects our ability to impart genuine Christianity to them because they see the hypocrisy. And you know, Joy and I waited like seven years until we had our first child, Adrian, which I think which is a good thing for us because we needed to iron out a lot of the challenges in our own Christian experiences so that we, could, we can be... Uh, healthy in our home. And I like to tell young parents or people that I'm going to marry and then they're thinking about having a family is that there's dysfunction in every home because we're dysfunctional, sinful human beings that are growing in grace, right? We're learning how to overcome and get victory. But we don't just be baptized and become perfect and never make a mistake or don't have any wrestling to deal with sin anymore in our lives. So in the Christian home, we can only, by the grace of God, minimize the amount of dysfunction or try and mitigate the amount of dysfunction our children are exposed to. And one dysfunction, though, that will certainly destroy the prospect of a young person to move forward in their Christian faith is if they see hypocrisy in the home. If they see their parents one thing in public and then another thing in the home, bad relationship in the home, non-Christian, genuine Christian experience in the home, that'll turn them off to Christianity more than anything else. So Christianity starts in the home. And if we have to be born again, filled with God's grace and God's spirit and have the ability to treat those whom we are supposed to treat 
who, those whom we're supposed to love, excuse me, more than anyone else, we need to be able to treat them the kindest and tenderest way possible and have a true, genuine experience in the home. And that's what this psalmist is saying, that he walks with a perfect heart in the home first. Do you want to walk with a perfect heart in the home? Do you want to be converted and know how to walk with Jesus in the home? Well, how do we do that? The Bible tells us, praise the Lord, very common passage. Turn with me to John chapter 15. You know this passage. John chapter 15. How to have a perfect heart in the home. John chapter 15. And I'm going to start in verse 1, and I'm just going to read a few verses. John chapter 15, verse 1. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Stop right there for a moment. What you see here, Jesus describing an experience that we are going to grow We're either going to grow and bear fruit in our lives that gives glory to God. That fruit is a Christian character, by the way. That's what it means to to, to bear fruit. This is the fruits of the Spirit, right? The fruits of the character of God to be like our Creator. We're either going to grow and bear fruit to God, or we're going to bear, or we're going to grow and bear sinful characteristics in our lives. And if we are sinful in our lives, the Bible says, Jesus says, that that branch is going to be cut off and it's going to be gathered up, it's going to be burned, right? We're going to be lost. So if we have a tendency to grow and increase in sin and uh, not bearing fruit to God, we'll be lost. But if we abide in Jesus and we grow and bear fruit for the honor and glory of God, we'll be saved, right? That's what he's saying here. He who abides in me will bring forth fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He who does not abide in me, the branch will wither. It'll be cut off. It'll be burned up, right? So grow and bear fruit to God. Grow and bear sin to death, right? Bear fruit to God for life. Bear sin, uh, grow and, and uh, fruit and bear sin to death. That's really the, the, what he's teaching us here. So we want to grow and bear fruit to God by abiding in Jesus. That's what he says. If you abide in me, you will grow fruit. It's impossible not to. But the question is often asked, how do you abide in Jesus? What does that mean? You know, and I'd love to hear your responses. But uh, I'm going to tell you, Jesus tells us right here exactly how to do that. Notice in the previous chapter, chapter 14, John chapter 14, this is how we abide in Christ. If you want to grow and bear fruit to the honor and glory of God, and you, but you do that by abiding in Jesus, this is how you abide. Notice uh, John chapter 14, verse 23. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our, what? Home with him. Yeah, this is what it means to abide in Jesus. It means the Father and the Son living inside of us. That's what abiding is, you know. If, if, uh, if, if, If the Father and the Son are making their home with us, then uh, you can say that we are abiding with them, right? Because they're inside of us. And how do we do that? It just told us, it just says, we need to keep the word, right? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Can the Father and Son abide in your life if you do not keep the word of Jesus? Not according to this. It says, if you keep the word, my word, the Father and I will come and make our home with you. But if you don't, obviously, they won't make their home with you. 
So we not only have to keep it, but we also have to hear it, right? Because you can't keep it until you first hear it. Notice verse 24. Same chapter, John 14, 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you, what? Hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So if you want to abide in Jesus, you need to do two things. Hear the word of God, hear the word of Jesus, and keep the word of Jesus, right? You can't abide if you do not hear and you do not keep. Going to church is not abiding in Jesus. It can help in that process, but it doesn't mean you're abiding in Jesus because you go to church. Uh, Just identifying as a Christian because you got baptized whenever doesn't mean you're abiding in Jesus. Being faithful even to a certain set of regulations and adherence to a certain set of doctrines doesn't mean you're abiding in Jesus. Abiding in Jesus, which is indispensable to bearing fruit to God so that we can be saved, requires two things, hearing the word of Jesus and doing the word of Jesus. Those two things, right? Because that's the only way to bear fruit. And if you don't bear fruit, you'll be cut down, cast into the fire. But if you abide in Jesus, it's inevitable. It's impossible for you not to bear fruit. You will bear fruit. Now, some people say, well, I I read the Bible and I, I hear the word of Jesus, but I find it difficult to follow what he says. I find myself continuing continuing to sin, you know, or struggling to do what he asks me to do. And that's a valid question. But the good news today is that Jesus answers that question. Jesus tells us specifically that he will give us a helper to help us do what he says. Notice, First of all, John chapter 16, you're in John chapter 14. We were in John chapter 15. Go to John chapter 16, verse 7. John chapter 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage, he told the disciples, that he goes away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you, and he will come. He will convict the world of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. That's the context here. The Holy Spirit's going to help us. It's going to be our helper. It's going to convict us. It's going to help us to see where we need to grow in our areas as Jesus is abiding with us. And not only that, it's going to guide and lead us. Notice in verse 12, same chapter, John 16, Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all what? truth. That's right. The Holy Spirit is there to help us, to guide us into all truth, and and, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible makes it very clear in the New Testament that the whole, one of the important functions of the Holy Spirit is to help us bear fruit to the honor and glory of God. Notice how the Apostle Paul puts it. I want want you to keep your finger here in John. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's look at verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Verse 18, here's a powerful verse. Memorize this verse because this is one of those cornerstone verses. I mean, your your Christian relationship, your Christian experience should be built on this cornerstone. Now we know Jesus is the chief cornerstone. It's built on Christ. But every building has more than one cornerstone, right? (laughs) You don't have a building if it's just one cornerstone. So this, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. This is an important cornerstone too. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Notice how the Holy Spirit works, how the Apostle Paul says it works in our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Actually, let's start in verse 17. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. If you have that verse in front of you, let me hear you say amen. All right, here we go. Now the Lord is a what? Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What does that word liberty mean? Besides liberty, what's a synonym for liberty? Freedom, that's right. We are not slaves, we are free. When the Spirit of God is working on our lives, free from what? Free from sin. Notice this verse 18 now. But we all with unveiled unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Pause right there. Where do we look and see a perfect mirror image of the character of God, of the character of the Father? 
That's right, in the life of Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen who? The Father. So looking at Jesus is like looking at a mirror image of God the Father. If you want to know what the Father's like, look at Jesus. So we're beholding as in a mirror with an unveiled, nothing to obstruct our vision, the full glory of the Father in the life of Jesus Christ. Continue on. As we're looking, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Isn't that exciting? The Apostle Paul says when we look at Jesus, when we behold his glory, the Holy Spirit transforms us into the same image. The Holy Spirit, the helper, the one that convicts us of our sin, that guides us to all truth, helps us to do what Jesus asks us to do. Remember, so how do we abide in Christ? We hear his word and we keep his word. If you love me, keep my commandments, keep my words. Do what I tell you to do. And if you love Jesus, you'll hear him speak to your heart through his word. You'll do what he tells you to do. And if you find that you're challenged by that, obviously we all are going to be challenged by it. We have a helper, this Holy Spirit, who comes to empower us to be faithful to God so that the Father and the Son can dwell in us and bring fruit, bear, enable us to bear fruit for their honor and glory. There's a great spirit of prophecy quote And she says, uh, regarding this work of the Holy Spirit, she says this, it is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil, and to impress his own character upon his church. That's a powerful quote. Through the Holy Spirit, we overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies towards sin, so that the character of God can be impressed upon us, so that we can bear fruit for his honor and for his glory. So we have to choose if we want to be perfect in our home by abiding in Jesus, hearing his word, doing what he says, and letting his Holy Spirit empower us. And Jesus said, if you do that, if you abide in me, you will bring forth fruit. But if we don't abide in Jesus, we don't hear his word, we don't do what he says, we don't let the Holy Spirit empower us uh, to bring forth fruit in his life, in our lives, then the sins in our lives will grow and they will become more prevalent. They will become, um, they will actually grow, become stronger. And in the end, we can't enjoy a forever friendship with God if the sin has been allowed to grow in our lives to the point where it overshadows, where it actually, you know, if you've got a vine and that vine has become full of weeds, All right, you're not going to have much life in that vine or in that plant anymore. And that's why Jesus said it'd have to be cut down and thrown into the fire because it really won't be useful. But if we're growing and bearing fruit, then God is pruning, he's helping to shape, he's helping us to grow and bear more fruit. So we have to decide, what are we going to grow? Sin or fruit to the honor and glory of God? And one thing I've noticed, the older a person gets, this has been my observation, having worked with a number of churches in my ministry where there's an elderly congregations. But the older people get, the more their sinful traits become uncontrollable. I don't know why that is. There, it's some, it must have to do, to do with something with age and the brain. But if we have a sinful trait in our life that we've been able to cover up or moderate to a degree in public, the older we get, the more difficult that becomes, right? So, you, so what I'm saying is that it's hard to hide your sins as you get older. It might be easier when you're younger and got a clearer mind, but as you get older, it becomes more difficult. I remember uh, when I first started in ministry over 20 years ago, 
I was working with a senior pastor. I was his associate pastor. He was, he was older than me. He's probably older than I am now. But I remember early on finding it very troubling that in private, he was always getting angry and losing his temper. I mean, over things that I thought were insignificant. It got to such a point that he would lose his anger that on Sabbath morning, I would just try to stay away from him. On Sabbath morning, I didn't want to, I just said, I'm going to not be around him because I don't want to cause him, inadvertently cause him stress before he has to go preach and serve the dear saints. So I just thought, let me just try to avoid him. And uh, he was always very good around church members though. But in private, man, any little thing would set him off. He had no patience and he, he had this kind of explosive anger that would come out. But you know, the older you get, and even when you're younger, sometimes it's hard to control that all the time, and it slips through, right? And I remember one time um, at this church I was at, this, the poor audiovisual people are always kind of like a few seconds late to do things, you know? You'd start the invocation prayer, and we wouldn't hear anything until halfway through the sentence they'd realize they'd, they need to turn the mic on or something like that, or the lights, whatever it was, they were always kind of a half a step off of everything, and it was obvious, poor, the dear saints, they tried to do the best they could. And I remember the pastor I was working with was giving the invocation that Sabbath. So everyone came out onto the platform, they kneeled. I was in the front row, I wasn't on the platform that Sabbath. So I was right there, probably closest to him, the pastor who was giving the invocation. And as he started to give the invocation, he, uh, his microphone wasn't on, as usual. The uh, audio visual people were a little bit late. And he was talking, but noth- they weren't putting it on. Normally they'd figure it out after like few words that it needed to be turned on. But they weren't turning it on. And then he stopped praying and I kind of opened my eyes and peeked a little bit and I noticed him gesturing so angrily and aggressively at the audiovisual people. He's like, ah, darn my mind. You know, he was just, and then finally they turned it on and he went, and dear Lord, I want to thank you for this beautiful day. And I thought to myself, I hope nobody else saw that because if anybody else just saw what I saw, I think it's going to ruin his witness because he was just totally freaking out. Like, it, like he, he had such an angry look on his face. Like if the audiovisual guy was right there, he would be wringing his neck, <laughs> right? Uh, and then as soon as the mic came on, he went from, ah, and I want to thank you. It's like he switched a switch, turned a switch and went to the humble, you know, Christian that he was supposed to be. And I thought, oh man, I hope nobody saw that. So as you get older, it's hard to conceal the sin in your life. Uh, Another story, I remember working with another church and our elder in the church was an older man. And he had some challenges. And I remember once at a, a board meeting, he was presenting some idea, something he wanted to do or some ministry of some sort. And some other elderly dear saint on the church board, an old lady, was questioning him about it. And something happened to the head elder. He got so angry at her questioning, you know, just the way that she was questioning him. He just stood up, and he was a bigger guy, and he just pointed at her and he said, shut up, shut up. And he just like totally had a meltdown and started freaking out. And again, I thought to myself, oh, this this is my head elder, you know, and he's, you know, he's about ready to kill someone, it seems like, you know, he just explodes. You know, again, the older you get, the harder it is to conceal the sin in your life. That's why we need to let Jesus remove the sin now so that we can have a perfect home. We can have a perfect heart in our home. And you might be saying, well, all right, I read the Bible. I believe that Jesus can change my life. I want to hear his word. I want to do what he says, and I want the Holy Spirit. What's the next step? I want to bear fruit to his honor and glory. Aha, he tells us. Turn back with me to John chapter 15, and we'll look at our last verses. John chapter 15, and notice verse 7 and 8, and we'll finish this sequence of verses on a very positive note. John 15, verses 7 and 8. Go back to where we started, John chapter 15, verse 7 and 8. 
what do we do now? We want to abide in Christ. We want to bear fruit. We want to have the Holy Spirit helping us to bear fruit. We want to hear Jesus' words. We want to do his words. Well, Jesus tells us, verse 7. Now, this is a powerful promise. Again, you should build your Christian faith on this promise, or, and others, but primarily this one. John chapter 15, verse 7, if Jesus said, you abide in my words, excuse me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Well, just stop right there. Now, people want to make this like a blanket promise. Well, if I'm abiding in Jesus, his words are abiding in me, I could ask whatever I will, whatever I want, and it'll be done. I want to win the lottery, you know, I want a million dollars. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, this is not a, um, you know, like a, a, this isn't some push button, an easy button to get whatever you want. This is in a very specific context. And the context that we've been reading is bearing fruit. And the very next verse tells us that exact same thing. Notice verse eight. By this, by what? By us asking, by us abiding in Christ and his, his words and asking, um, asking the Father, asking the Father's will to be done in our lives, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. You see that? What do we do? We ask. Jesus said, right in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. What do we desire? We want to bear fruit. So we ask, Lord, today, help me to bear fruit. And Jesus says, it shall be done for you. That's a promise. It shall be done for you, the end of verse 7. And by this, by having what we ask to bear fruit, being done for us, God will be glorified because we're going to bear how much fruit? At the end of verse 8, much fruit, much fruit. So we have to ask and ask God, Lord, today, you know, help me today to bear fruit for your honor and glory. Help me to walk in my home with a perfect heart today. And you know something? Jesus said, it will be done for you. So we got to abide in Christ. That means hear his word. If you don't have a Bible, or if you're not reading your Bible, you're not hearing his word. Do his word. The Holy Spirit is there to help us, to enable us to do it, to transform us and to empower us to do it. And we need to ask that it be done in our lives. And it will be done. And we will bear much fruit. God will be successful. He can accomplish it in our lives if we choose to let him. Let me just close with a spirit of prophecy quote that affirms this. She says this about Jesus. And she says, Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. The life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as in him. Living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ, you bear fruit after the similitude of Christ. Oh, friends, is it your desire to have a perfect heart in your own home, to be a Christian in your home first so that you can love and bless those who are closest to you? And if you could succeed there by growing and abiding in Christ, you will succeed everywhere in your life. Is that your desire today? And you want to ask and have it done for you? Why don't you go ahead and bow your heads and we'll pray this morning. Lord, I'm so grateful today that you've given us the formula for success. You've given us rational minds to grasp it and understand it. You've given, us, you've given us all a measure of faith so that we could believe it and hope in it. And all we need to do is put forth the effort to embrace it in our lives and to allow you to fulfill your word in our lives. And when we do that, we will succeed. 
because you succeeded. So bless us, I pray, so that we might walk in our home with a perfect heart, that we might be a Christian first at home. Then in our, from there, we'll be successful in the community and in the churches. So bless us, I pray, Lord. Our eyes are upon you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.